Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Thank you very much for joining us. First, a few logistics. May I ask all of you to keep your cell phones on mute? Easy one, but please do. Thank you so much. And likewise for my panelists. So good afternoon. Uh, we know it's been a very, very busy health, World Health Summit this year. It's every year, it's a new challenge. Every year it's addressing new, new questions and, and new issues, becoming more and more high level and, and challenging. We're very, very proud to be here today. I can say this is the first time the, the World Health Summit is hosting on its plenary a session on a usually neglected topic, which is supply chain and delivery. I'm very honored to have an amazing set of panelists with us, ranging from public sector to private sector, ranging from national country perspective to global institutional perspective, ranging from technical to strategic perspective. So we hope we will give you some perspective on what we mean by supply chain and delivery being an enabler. It's usually seen as a challenge and barrier to access in low and middle income countries particularly. But the idea is very much to give you a sense of beyond that, how we, in our vision we want to enable supply chain and delivery to become one of the critical enabler in order to access patients in low and middle income countries wherever they are in a timely fashion with the best solution suited to their needs. So there's a bit of a background for that. So in order to reach that, I want first of all to give, to give you a sense of who is on the panel today. And so we have, we're very, very honored to have the presence of Honorable Kwaku Ajeman Manu, Ministry of Health of Ghana. Thank you very much, sir, for joining us today. It's a great pleasure having you. It's a very interesting character and, and professional background. Uh, when when you, you look at it as a background and experience of, of uh, Agim and Manu, uh, it's interesting to see he's been in many different positions in the public sector. And that thing is going to shed light on the topic we want to address. Not only is currently Ministry of Health, Minister of Health of Ghana, but he's been in position ranging from transportation to communication, Ministry of Health, of Interior, as well as communication, trade and industry. So I do believe that this range of experience is going to bring a lot of opportunity for us to discuss how we move from silo perspective into integrated perspective. So very happy for your presence. I've done something. Oops. I'm playing with a... How do I go back? <laughs> Thank you. Technical issue? Thank you. So, second, we, we, we have the presence of uh, Dr. Manfred Huck-Burg from Roche. Uh, Manfred has a, is a, has a long, long experience in supply chain. He's currently at Roche heading um, collaboration partnership. It's a very new function at Roche. It shows the leadership of Roche in this area. Uh, Manfred is a pharmacist by training. He's been doing a cl clearly a lot of activities at the corporate level, but recently has been working mainly in country. So I think from the private industry, in country perspective is going to be very interesting to have perspective from Manfred. Martin Ellis uh, is the head of supply chain at the Global Fund to fight HTB Malaria, based in Geneva. Same thing, very interesting profile and experience, ranging from health, aerospace, indeed, we were having a discussion before, and interestingly enough, according, with all this wealth of experience in a variety of different industry, the bottom line is how do we move one box from one place to another, which, whatever is in this box, and that's going to be very interesting to get the perspective from Martin, partly from the Global Fund, who ha which has been increasingly engaging in this kind of discussion, and Martin will give us more information around that. So thank you, Martin, for joining us. I'm very happy to introduce also Christina, from Roche. So Cristina Castro Gonzalez de Vega, she's the Africa Strategy PT program lead at Roche. Same thing, they're working very closely with, uh, with Manfred and have been a very strong prop proponent and advocate for addressing the supply chain in access issues. Uh, she comes with a wealth of experience as well and a lot of experience from newly launched program in countries ranging from Kenya, Nigeria, Ghana. So that's going to be very interesting. She comes also for experience from other sector, 
consumer goods, telecommunication, oil and gas. So thank you. And not least, but she's a woman. And we're very happy to have a gender balance on our panel. I am a woman too. <laughs> Then I'm happy to introduce you also to Philippe Francois, uh, the global head of supply chain at Novartis. Same thing, very interesting profile. He comes from the consumer goods uh, industry. He's been working at Baxter for many years in a variety of positions, and he's been uh, at the helm of Novartis supply chain for a year now. Very, very visionary pers perspective on what supply chain is all about. So I think it's going to be a very interesting session. And then last but not the least, we're very happy to have on the panel as well, Rudiger Craig, Dr. Rudiger Craig from the World Health Organization. What is interesting about the participation of, of Rudiger is uh, you do know that the World Health Organization is a normative body. Uh, setting up guidelines, but they are engaging more and more on coordination and implementation. So to have the perspective from the WHO, which is this international normative body and, and the coordinating body on health, and how they see supply chain as a neglected topic and how we're going to bring it to the fore, forefront, that's going to, it's really interesting. And, and I want to thank you as well for your participation. Wide array of experience in a variety of fields, let alone uh, training, empowerment, uh, a very interesting vision on collaboration. Uh, so I think it's going to be a very interesting session. So uh, what the background to our session is, we want to really stir interaction. So we are going to test a new model on how to moderate this session. I will be your happy moderator. I'll do my best. And the idea is we will ask uh, Honorable uh, Ministry of Health to provide the big picture and perspective from Ghana on what are the challenges in country. And then what the idea is to have a moderated panel discussion with the panelists to address specific questions. And we will open systematically to you so you can also chime in and from your perspective ask questions. We don't want to have a whole set of presentation and right at the end five, five minutes to get you on board. What we want is just make sure you are on board from the very beginning so we re rely upon you to chime in. So let me give you a bit of background. Access. What is access? There's a variety of perspective on what constitutes access. What are the challenges of access? Usually, usually, and traditionally is enshrined in one specific focus of access, which is inability to pay, what we call affordability challenge. And usually the whole issue around access revolves around one thing, price. What we believe is price is obviously an element, but this is absolutely not the only element. And if we do not tackle the complexity of the access challenge and make sure that every single barrier is addressed in an integrated and coordinated way, we will not deliver. We do know that the World Health Organization has a list of essential drug lists, medicines, and this, those drugs and medicines are defined as essential in order for health system to operate. 98% of those drugs are off patent. Pricing is not an issue. Affordability is not an issue. And yet, they don't reach patients. So we do realize that part of the access challenge, a major issue is about infrastructure, capacity building, supply chain and delivery, ensuring that the medicine or solution gets from the manufacturing site, wherever it is, to the bedside of the patient. And this is a long journey. And this is the way we look at supply chain from manufacturing and even before to the bedside and after monitoring pharmacovigilance. All of that. So we have a very broad perspective on, on what constitutes supply chain. And this is very much enshrined into the main ambition and objective of the international political agenda, starting with the Millennium Development Goals. So we know that in the, in the Development Goals, there was one goal for health. In the new model, the SDG, there's 17 goals, two of which are really focusing somehow on health but we do believe that health is in all policies. But when we look in the details of the SDG, very uh, broad approach and understanding of health and development, but when you look at the details, we've noticed there is no consideration for supply chain and delivery. Yet we will need to deliver food, water, medicines, health, development to those countries and yet there is no consideration for infrastructure, supply chain, and delivery. So we do believe we need to put back access delivery system, in delivery capabilities, not system, into the, in, into the, uh, to the fore. That's what we, we call for. And we have a, st a strong alignment on that. 
WHO has been setting up some guidelines. This supply chain is becoming an interesting and a focus area. Usually supply chain is addressed uh, mainly in technical area, vaccines, HIV, TB, global fund. But when you talk about non-disease specific, there is no, no focus on supply chain. So that's what we call for, and we're asking for, for support from all stakeholders to work on that. So if you look at the supply chain, usually we have a very linear perspective on supply chain from manufacturing to the bedside. But in reality, when you go into countries, and I'm sure uh, Honorable uh, Ministry of Health will be telling us about that, it's just the reality in country is extremely complex. So we are simplifying with a simple model a very complex environment, and yet we need to work with that. With, major intermediaries, major markups, very, and every country is different. And within country, every community is different. And within the community, every disease area way of, of sort is different. So this is very, that's in back of our mind. So how do we make a complex world into something we can tackle? And the only way forward is, is together. We have, uh, I want to just uh, uh, underscore uh, an activity which has been led by the industry. So uh, traditionally the industry, I mean the pharmaceutical private industry, has not been recognized as a, a, a partner to work on those kind of issues. Five years ago when we were starting discussing with international organizations and stakeholders, when we talked about supply chain, there was just, oh no, but the industry has no role here. And then we realized working with our supply chain uh, experts, we can deliver any innovative solution wherever we want in the world. So if we do not have expertise and if we cannot contribute to that, there's something we're missing. So we created an alliance of 14 leading pharmaceutical companies on addressing that. So we have a platform which is called Accessibility Platform where we share information, best practices, and we engage in collective action. And part of this industry-led, we have stakeholders ranging from the Gates Foundation, World Health Organization, the, Gate, the, the Gates Foundation, I said that already, the Global Fund, uh, a variety of stakeholders people deliver, so academia, and we try to just get uh, collaboration and collective action in this field. In this area, we are launching a call for action, and our call, call, call for action relies upon six principles, key of which patient is at the center, Supply chain may be here, but if you don't enable supply chain, you will not reach patients. So we do believe supply chain is close to the patient. Collaboration, alone we cannot reach it. There's so much to be done. So alone we can only contribute to something. Together we can make a sustainable, impactful impact over time. Uh, we believe there's no one size, size fits all. So there may be a model, but every country is different. Every disease is different. Every patient is different. Every solution needs something. So we, although we want to take a very strategic approach, we do realize there is no size fits all. So if you're interested in this platform, feel free to, to talk to us, and we'll be happy to talk about that. So with this introduction, I'm very happy to welcome Honorable Ministry of Health for the opening remarks. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. And let me say good afternoon. I think it's an honor and a privilege for me to be part of this health summit, and in particular, me getting the chance or the slot to do the opening remarks at this panel discussion. Access to health has become a topical issue in my country, Ghana, now. Of late, everybody is talking about access. And it is not by any magic or anything, it was designed for the country to talk about access. The current president of the country made sure that in his party's manifesto for the campaign that voted him to power, put into access, equitably distributed for health, the manifesto. And that is an agenda he is pursuing. So that has become a priority for his government. Again, in Ghana's constitution, we have right to health. And so people are now becoming aware of their right, and people have started talking about access as well. 
Previous governments, including even the current government, is still investing in infrastructure, training and deploying health workers, tooling and retooling facilities with equipment and devices. Government is also making sure that commodities and consumables, drugs and non-drugs, are available at all levels. These efforts, in my estimation, may provide the full complement of quality health care for all and equitably provided. But this can be done with a critical enabler to be a little bit more efficient if we have a very well-designed, modeled, and efficiently working supply chain. That will ensure availability at the right time, at the right place, at the right prices that are affordable um, and of good quality for all. Making sure that commodities are available can be a complex management issue. In Ghana, supply chain master plan has been centrally managed with intricate vertical, top-down, and bottom-up linkages to country and systems at all levels. The rationale is to provide to the doorsteps of health providers essential health commodities as and when needed for continuous delivery of quality and affordable health services. Following a fire outbreak at our Central Medical stores about three years ago, a bold decision was made to reform and strengthen the systems with which commodities are procured and distributed. To ensure efficiency and responsiveness to the needs of the patient, the Ministry of Health has developed a new supply chain master plan. And key components of this plan uh, procurement reforms, we're trying to adopt moving a little bit away from bulk purchasing into what is described as framework contracting to be adopted. We are still working on it with assistance from Global Fund. And um, about a about few weeks now, we got to a stage where we started getting into the OP market to try to do procurement activity to select um, contractors who will go to help us do freeway contracting and supply medicines in the country. Another key component is the last mile distribution program where health commodities are delivered to the facility level. And here haulage is done by private sector and at the moment we are currently covering about 60% of the country. So facilities that are not yet reached come to our regional medical sites for their commodities. We have actually done a warehousing strategy that links the central medical stores to regional medical stores and to the district stores attached to the facilities for commodities. Bulk procurement at both central medical stores and regional medical stores are being done for onward distribution to facilities. And in storm instances, facilities at the district level um, are allowed to procure. We have a structure that we can describe for public facilities in our country. We have the high-end tertiary facilities sitting in the big cities, about four or five of them. Then we have 10 regional hospitals. Below that, we try to ensure that every district has got a hospital that can do at least primary care with some interventions that can be done at the tertiary level. Below districts, we have the sub-districts and now what we call the community health uh, planning services. That is the chip zones to the very basic level 
of um, communities that we can reach. And so when we move from the central medical stores to the regional medical stores to the districts, the sub-districts and the community um, facilities will then have to come to take their stores or commodities from the districts. Another key component is the logistics management information system. Hitherto, we haven't been driving our supplies and procurement so much on um, internet solutions. Um, but now, we're trying to see how best we can track procurement, distribution, storage, and even dispensing on systems that are transparent with the help of IT solutions that we are trying to procure. So I must say that we are in transition now. Our last mile distribution, I've said earlier, is about 60% complete. We have just started the procurement process for through my contracting, I said earlier. We have just shortlisted companies for selection to provide ICT solutions to enable us to run the last mile information systems that we want to I mean, uh, operate. And our warehousing strategy has been developed and it is now being implemented. By the end of 2018, we anticipate seeing a more robust supply chain master plan fully in place for a robust supply chain and delivery systems. Our belief is that you can put all investments that we have, train health workers, deploy them, get the best infrastructure facilities that you can have in your country. But if you don't have a very efficient, functioning, working supply chain system, I don't think you are doing so well. And what you want to do with making sure that people have access to health might not be achieved. The SDGs, we can't get nowhere close to them. But there are issues. Ghana is about one of the countries where medicines and drugs are priced very, very, very high. And if you look at the situation where we are, very large, low-income people, and then prices of medicines very high. So how do we reconcile this if you want to achieve access for all, so far as health is concerned? Again, the quality of drugs that we get in our country also has something to talk about. We have one of the very good um, drugs agency that regulates, inspects, makes sure that we have quality drugs. Along the West Coast, Akambuza, Ghana has got the most efficient food and drugs agency and probably very high listed in Africa. But we still have challenges with medicines that are coming into our country, um, which might not pass very serious quality tests. I talk about high to rich areas in our country, our infrastructure systems into transportation are not very seriously developed yet, fully. So we'll still have some pockets of areas where we cannot reach so easily. To the extent that even when you deploy doctors and health workers to those areas, they wouldn't want to move. But government is working to incentivize people to move into those areas. And we'll have to make sure that we reach them with medications. Taxes are still a bit high. And customs are working. Only that I wouldn't call them very efficiently because of the influx of some fake drugs into our country. And we also have exposure and some high of high quality drugs that are only found in our big cities. So Rush wouldn't know my constituency because they are selling drugs that are a bit expensive in terms of our country and um, treating um, medic I mean diseases, disease burdens that are not done at the district level. So if somebody is afflicted and is referred to a tertiary institution and the person goes back to the village, 
he will have no access to drugs that may have been prescribed to him or her. So he may have to be traveling back into the city to procure these drugs. And therefore, access can only be on the supply chain thing, but also incomes is another thing that we need to talk about. That will be on another platform. But for now, I believe that we need to improve our supply chain systems with these challenges. I'd like to thank you and end my presentation. I'm grateful. Your Excellency, I think it's been a fantastic uh, perspective, very much focusing on supply chain and delivery challenges within your country. Obviously, you've been focusing on three main challenges you see as critical for enabling access in your country. Uh, quality, counterfeit, counterfeit drugs, pallet trade. So that would be one of the critical issues for you. Second one would be public quality, how to ensure quality solution for all, your, for all in your country at all levels. And the third one, access affordability issue, which is probably not directly linked to our topic, but to some extent supply chain can be an enabler for lowering price through the markups and how you just streamline markups and infrastructure so you do avoid this kind of, of, of situation. But in order to tackle this last mile issue which you have within country, uh, the way we, we think about that is just you, we need to build up first mile. So on the first mile, I will ask to ask you, Christina, from, from Roche's perspective, uh, from your perspective as a private company, how do you see uh, uh, ways of providing support in improving the first mile in order to address those last mile issues within the supply chain? Uh, can you give us a sense of what are the key challenges according to you in this area? Thank you, Frederick. Can you hear me? Yeah. Good afternoon, everybody. So thank you very much, Mr. Excellency, as well, to explain the key challenges in, uh, in Ghana. So from a pharma perspective, um, I think uh, that was already shared in, in the introduction. So the very big challenge we have is the so complex and fragmented supply chain. You saw a graphic where you have already public sector, private sector, faith-based sector, NGO sector, different channels with their own supply chain, if you will, and even a different supply chain depending on, on the disease area. So that for supply chain already entails a lot of complex supply chain issues in terms of how do we make sure we bring the right product, the right time, and the right quality to the right patient, to the hospital, to the district clinics. So that's the key challenges. Uh, how do we translate uh, the patient needs into what needs to be manufactured one year in advance, distributed to all the different channels, and make sure the patient in Ghana gets it on time in that specific district or, or community. So a lot of, um, let's say, challenges. Main one is first connecting what we call the first mile and the last mile you mentioned. So having this end-to-end -end view and oversight and control of that, that's the, the first challenge we have. Um, then key challenge in terms of quality. What about cold chain management? We're talking about vaccines, uh, cancer drugs, which need to be stored in the right temperature. Um, what is the infrastructure we have in those countries? That's a key challenge we've seen. And the major one as well, which was called out um, as well, is the, is the markup. So we are aware of that, and, and we do have a key role in terms of making those complex to supply chain linear, so um, let's say leaner, less layers. It will help us reduce all the different markups which are charged in all these different levels. Thank, Thank you, you very much. What I would like to do is just, uh, uh, same thing f from, from the Global Fund perspective. You have a private perspective. I'd like to understand from the Global Fund perspective, procurement agency, two things. So really about just what Christina has been talking about, the end-to-end -end management. How do you see that? But before answering that, I would like to know from your perspective, from the fund perspective, what is supply chain and delivery within your perspective? People, some people talk about first mile, last mile, some people talk about upstream, downstream, and there's a variety of intervention. From the Global Fund, what is your thinking around what constitutes supply chain challenges? And within that, how do you address end-to-end -end control? Sure, thank you, thank you very much. Um, I think supply chain um, means a lot of things to a lot of different people, depending on what, sh what shoes you're wearing. So, uh, for instance, if I talk to some of my colleagues out in Africa and uh, well, I go to the, to the front line, to the, uh, to the district facilities, uh, to them, uh, 
supply chain is getting the products from the district, from the regional warehouses, and getting it to the health facilities. Um, if you talk to somebody who's further up uh, upstream, so you're talking about somebody who's working in the uh, central warehouse, then it becomes something totally different. Uh, in the global funds perspective, uh, I'm taking a more holistic look. And the way we tend to look at it is uh, in, a, in a, a, a Z or a, a Z shape. So it, the Z starts with data. And, uh, you know, we talk about upstream and downstream, and we talk about first mile and last mile. But uh, all supply chains start with demand and consumption. And uh, so we need that data. So there's a data stream that goes one way. There's then the physical flow that goes the other way, and then there's a finance that goes uh, back, back uh, um, upstream as, as well. So there's a, there's a Z shape. And each one of those, uh, each one of those lines um, has a people, a process, a technology, a policy uh, aspect to it that needs to be, to, to be optimized. Um, so for, for, for me, it's a more holistic look at supply chain, and it sort of goes beyond just first and last. It goes before that, and it's all about data capture. Thank you. I'll revert to you, Rudiger, now. From the WHO perspective, I was, as I was saying, the WHO is a normative body, and you are increasingly engaging on supply chain, realizing this is an enabler for, for access and for the mandate of the WHO. So from your perspective, uh, can you give us a bit of a sense of what the understanding of WHO around last mile issue, first to last mile issues, and, and how you've been over the past years engaging further on that? So just to have a different perspective on, on the similar question. Very well. So, um, f first of all, um, when, when, when I first got to this issue of supply chains, I thought, my God, that's quite a dry technical issue. Very um, different views, as you might, was, was just saying, depending on where you look at it. F huge experts. And I think it's the most um, interesting example of how intersectoral collaboration, um, health in different policies could actually work. And let me outline a little bit why we, why we see this as an issue uh, in WHO. Um, we're approaching uh, th this obviously from a universal health coverage point of view. So there's a sustainable development goal, as you've rightly showed there in your introduction, that says that everybody should have access to uh, the services, but also the medicines everybody needs without facing financial hardship. And this goes a bit beyond the essential medicines list that we put forward. So this really means that we want to see everybody having this access to the medicine and actually taking the medicine also when he or she needs it. Now, this has different problems and challenges right from the start. First of all, we need to ensure that um, the drugs that we take, and Minister, you framed it beautifully, the, the, the medicines we take should be efficacious. So that's the first thing. So um, first of all, we need to see which medicines reach the market, and then are they safe? So the first thing for us is to assist um, our member states uh, in regulating such medicines. And uh, not every country, country like yours has a very, very well-functioning national regulatory authority. So about 70% of countries don't have that. So we're working with those countries, number one, to get them, but number two, if they don't have them, to pre-qualify those medicines for them. So it's about 70% of the market. Then secondly, um, as you rightly said, sometimes these prices are much too high. And this is not the time to talk about this, but the overall market is out of balance. It's very intransparent, and we don't know how prices are set. So therefore, it is in our all interests of the world to have more transparency in this in order to um, have people uh, have access to those medicines without facing this financial hardship. And then you have the whole issue of procurement. Also there, you have lots of challenges. If you um, want to procure the right um, quantity of medicines at the right time, and very often we face a lot of problems, and sometimes perhaps also due to our regulations, uh, that you have um, too much um, or too little of one medicine being stored in, in a warehouse which doesn't reach the people. 
So therefore, we need better collaboration and understanding where these bottlenecks are. And then, last not least, you have, or you have a lot of falsified medicines reaching the market, which is also one of these elephants. Um, at the moment, we estimate that the, um, the, the um, market of falsified medicines is as high as the heroin market. So there's gangs out there who actually bring falsified medicines into the market with huge impacts on people's health and death. So it's a huge issue for us to, uh, to um, counteract that, that uh, phenomenon. And then last not least, it's the doctors who need to prescribe the right medicines at the right time. And also there in many countries, not only in developing countries, but in many countries, we do have problems with that. If we just look at the AMR, much too much antibiotics are prescribed. Um, and then late, last not least, it's the patient who takes the medicines who um, we ho hopefully have a, a high compliance with the doctor's recommendation. So you can see from the big uh, issue of what sort of medicines do we need and are they of a sufficient efficacy down to the patient taking the drug. There's many things on the way that require this intersectoral collaboration. Thank you very much. So just to, to, to go on on this discussion, which I, I think is very important, what we know is just often in, in emerging low and middle income countries, we, we're missing data in, do, in order to drive informed decision making. And it's, it's difficult because we are in a situation of, of, uh, of uh, you need to trade off in between different choices with very limited resources. When it comes to uh, supply chain, I understand the private industry does have a variety of data and information, and you need to manage that throughout the whole supply chain system, the flow of information, uh, in order to make sure that you connect the first mile to the last mile, address uh, issue of fa falsification, traceability of issue. And the industry will be responsible for this kind of side, side effects. From your perspective, uh, I will ask uh, Philip. From your perspective, in terms of managing this continuous flow of information, how you inform from uh, volume to, to price, and how, how does that work from your perspective in order to make it end to end? Yeah, thank you very much for the question. I mean, the way we looked at it, of course, in the industry is end to end again. I think we all have the same mandate here, which is to provide a safe drug to the patient on time and every time. That's our mandate. And of course, we need to manage a huge complexity. I mean, if I looked at the Novartis supply chain, I mean, we're delivering products, you know, uh, in basically 150 countries. And if I looked at the backstream, you know, the network of um, manufacturing plants that you have, we are dealing with more than 1,000 plants worldwide between what the one we have internally and, of course, uh, all the external ones. And the key is really to connect the dots and to make sure that you've got simple processes, and I insist here on the simple one, okay, because simple is reliable to make sure that you connect the dots end to end. And even if you don't have all the information, at the end of the day, the most important one is the one at the end, which is how the patient is going to use your drugs, the conception directly in the market. Of course, it's a challenge. And on top of that, I mean, it's a, it's a moving target all the time. I mean, the mondialization, of course, has a huge impact on the setup of the supply chain. I mean, you know, historically, of course, the, um, the pharma industry was trying to control all the steps of the processes. And we know now is the current complexity and of course, with the technology of the different drugs, it's basically impossible to have all the steps. So you, we have the opportunity, of course, to, uh, to rely on partners to do that, which is also bringing an additional complexity because you need to, uh, to, uh, to basically uh, bring uh, additional steps. At the same time, I think it's also an opportunity for us because we do have partners which are going to help you, in fact, to push the product you know, within the country and potentially start to think about you know, possibilities to start to shrink the lead time. One of the big issues we've got, of course, in the industry is the lead time. Between the time you buy the raw materials and the time the, the products end up in the market, we're talking about 12 to 18 months minimum. And of course, you need to anticipate all the time, produce in advance, and you, 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 you make a guess sometimes because, of course, forecast accuracy is very, very poor. But there are opportunities in the market now to start to think about the design of the supply chain and start to look at the capabilities, even in emerging countries, to help you to push, in fact, the product downstream and to start to look at added value locally, not just hub, but what about packaging locally, trying to understand how you can design your supply chain to be more agile, to make sure that you're going to face the complexity of the variability, which is there, with different solutions. 
So we do have, in fact, lots of opportunity in front of us, which is going to allow us, of course, to, uh, to answer partially to that challenge. Thank you so much. Um, Honorable Ajim, Ajim and Manu, I'm wondering from your perspective, obviously, Ghana, I'm very impressed. I didn't realize you had a, a full-blown strategy around supply chain. This is new. This is certainly a model to be replicated across Africa and in other countries. But when I listen to all of you, I realize everybody has very strong programs and initiatives and very, very dedicated strategy. But I'm not hearing anybody talking about where collaboration works. So from your perspective, hearing uh, even the latest intervention from Philippe of Novartis on data, would this kind of data be re relevant for you to drive your agenda? Are you working with stakeholders beside, I understand it's led by the Ministry of Health, are you within the government already working with the Ministry of Transportation, the Ministry of Trade, Education, or is it only within health? And beside government, are you already working with other stakeholders and what do you need from your stakeholders in order to make it happen? I said earlier on that the issue on supply chain is a very complex matter to manage. And therefore, one entity can't go and do it alone. You go to procurement, you need supplies, you need a wholesalers, you need manufacturers, you go to transportation, you go to roads and other infrastructure. So you just cannot do without collaboration. Apart from that, you need donor partners, you need well-experienced and well-skilled people who actually hands-on manage um, supply chain systems from the supply from the um, private sector. You need to collaborate with even Minister of Finance if you're looking at affordability and tax issues and what it is that you want to do. Pharmacists and those who actually work with medicines and things like that, the drug agencies. So collaboration is there. Presently, the procurement and things that we do through the Central America so system. The haulage is not done by any government institution. Right? Um, is it um, DFID in Ghana? And um, have actually, um, how do I call it? Rented a warehouse where they put their imports immediately there. And along the line of last mile distribution concept, they have actually hired private sector village people who are doing their distribution. Same as Global Fund. Even my ministry, procurement, and things that we receive commodities from donors, we move them with private sector village companies. So government is not even involved with distribution when it comes to taking goods from one end to the other. When it comes to pricing, you can't do without very efficient procurement systems such that you introduce some transparency into how much you are buying these commodities for. And um, you play ball with wholesalers and retailers at certain points. So collaboration is a very, very critical um, stakeholder word to use. And without that, I don't see how you can succeed in getting any efficient management along the supply chain, no matter what complex models and how innovative you become you will need to collaborate with other um, groupings or stakeholders along the chain. It's delightful to hear that. So before we move further, I think it's been a very rich already interaction. I would like to make sure, do we have any question, clarification, issue, anybody in the room will be interested in raising around government perspective, counterfeits, first smile? Please, could you give the microphone? Thank you so much, because otherwise we'll be, end up just having a great conversation, but the idea is just, please chime in. Lady in third row. And please introduce yourself. Okay. Hi, Vinona Bhatia from Roche. Uh, just a quick question um, about delivery. I know we hear a lot about drones and about, uh, you know, sort of small-scale projects in places like Rwanda, Tanzania. I'm just wondering, like, what, what is the future of it? Like, is it something that's going to be a reality? Is it going to be scaled up? How do you, how do you see it? I think this is a very good question and something we, wanted, we want to address. Absolutely, what is the role of innovation and all the new technology? So, Martin, I'm sure you've got to... Um. Drones uh, have, got a, have, got a, have got a place. Um, 
it's not a one size fits all. I think you, you use drones when you really do have a, a problem with, with, with access because of uh, uh, road uh, difficulties or there's, there's been landslides or there's been uh, torrential rain, uh, it's raining season, etc. And uh, un until recently, uh, it's been very difficult to, um, to, to, to use drones because of their, their, the two big limiting factors are, are payload and, and also um, uh, the, the, the range. Now, you're quite right, zip line are out in, in Rwanda, and uh, what they've done is they've got a fixed wing uh, drone which uh, delivers uh, blood um, for, for transfusions. I've actually been out there and launched one. And they're, they're great, but they, they only have a one kilogram uh, payload. Um, they can go uh, 30 odd kilometers there and back, but they've only got one, one kilogram. Now, that makes it very restrictive when you think about what can we use those drones for. Now, actually, in a couple of weeks' time, I'm going out, in fact, next week, I'm going out to, uh, to, to Norway, and uh, they've got a, a very much larger um, drone. They, they call it an octocopter because they've got uh, eight, eight rotaries, and uh, that's got a payload of 30 to 50 kilograms with de dependent on range uh, of up to about 25 kilo kilometers. And that's where it starts getting very, very interesting because the, the payload starts to get to a point where we can start thinking about using that to get to the, to the health facilities. Um, but again, that, that is still quite lightweight uh, when you think about it, and you'd have to do very, very regular runs. You know, you'd be having to talk about going uh, weekly uh, rather than, uh, than the, the three monthly replenishments that we have um, in many countries, which uh, are, are, are by itself is, is a problem, and we'll talk about that, about that later. So I think tr you know, drones have got a place, um, but uh, it, it's, as I say, it's, it's going to be for, for bespoke cases, I think. Very interesting perspective. Indeed, there's a lot of new innovations. Some are nice and fancy to have. And drone, in some extent, to some extent, can be that, and and they may be critical in order to address what we want to address. So it's a bit of a yeah. There's a lot of pilots all over in many different areas, and some may be just very fancy, and others are critical in making an impact. And that's something we need to understand. So, please, yeah. Yes, drones. We started talking about drones in Ghana. Please do. Especially my ministry. But you see, when new, technolog new technologies arrive, they come at a cost. And not until those who have the property rights make their money out of it and it's like they are satisfied. It's very difficult to get them into systems like ours. And I hope you understand what I mean. Without drones, cost of medications, drugs are quite expensive now in my country. We bring in drones to the far end last mile area where people live in that have very low incomes as compared to the cities. So how do we subsidize them to assess this? So it's a new technology. We accept it. We will get, it, get to it. Definitely with some time to come, that is where we will begin to go. But it's too early in time for us to start actually thinking about investing into those areas. But they are on our drawing boards. We, we definitely hear you. Obviously, there's, there's, there are a variety of constraint, constraints, resource constraints, even capability constraints. Do you have the right people and, and train? And probably the priority goes bef somewhere else before getting a, a full-blown a full uh, drone strategy for supply chain. So we understand. But this is, this is the future, so we need to invest today in order to tackle for the future. But today, today from your perspective, uh, where are the critical potential for collaboration, not the nice to have, but where are within the supply chain first mile, where do you think collaboration across stakeholders is necessary to make an impact? Not a nice to have because we need to collaborate, but really where you have a key challenge and unless you work with the other partner, you will be able to, to address that. Anybody can give an example? Rodiga, thank you. Yeah, and I think, um, Minister, you, you mentioned it briefly, um, that we have um, stakeholders who um, help you um, in Ghana, um, and because they want to be efficient and quick, they build, out, build their own system. All right, so you talked about DFID, and we could talk about other bilateral agencies like USAID or others, uh, also multilateral. And lateral. So sometimes we have six parallel um, systems for supply chains. And I would say that's perhaps not the best way of doing things. So could we think of having one supply chain for everybody? 
that would be the challenge. Because then we would need to agree on the way we do business, and we would need to agree on uh, who does what. So what are the roles and resp responsibilities of all the different players? And I think that's the way forward. Asking you, I'm sorry, before asking you to, I would like Martin as well, I understand Martin, you do operate in countries, there are guidelines which are derived from the WHO, and in fact in countries those guidelines don't apply because there's one size fits all, but it doesn't work in country. So if you could provide your perspective and then I'll ask you from your perspective from the country, how do you see that and how we want to tackle that? Sure, I think I can think sort of answer two, two questions in one there. That, um, Sometimes, you know, we're, we're, we're what you may call a financier uh, donor organization. And uh, sometimes I, I agree. I, I don't know whether we're, we're helping or hindering uh, <laughs> in, in developing supply chains because you're quite right. Uh, a donor will come in. They'll look at the broken national supply chain. They'll decide to put a, a, a parallel one in. The next one comes in. They say it's too broken. I don't want to work with, that, with them. I'll put a parallel one in. Before you know it, you've got your six. Uh, each of those come with their own infrastructure. So they've got their own people. Uh, they've, got their, uh, they've got their offices. They've got their own three land cruisers parked outside. And, and it, it just becomes, it becomes a, a very complex um, uh, mess in a way. And it, it, because that's fragmented uh, and we're doing it that way, it becomes unattractive to, to private sector to want to come into that because there's, there's no economies of scale, it, it's difficult to enter. And so I think there's, a, there's, there's something we need to do to make the supply chains more efficient and effective. Um, before we can start bringing su su uh, private sector in. Um, I, I think we, we, we want to bring them in as, as fast as we can, but sometimes uh, with very, very parallel, fragmented supply chains, there's some sort of uh, smoothing out that we've got to do on the way. Uh, the other point I'd like to make is that uh, we've also, uh, as we were talking, we've got to think about how we're going to work these supply chains because um, in the past, I, I know a lot of, uh, a lot of countries uh, in Africa, they operate a, a three-monthly replenishment system. Now, what that tends to mean is that we're holding uh, possibly six months, because you're, you're replenishing three months, so three months has got to go every three months, you're, you've got that and you've got a buffer stock. So at the central warehouse, you may have three months plus another two or three months. At the regional warehouse down, down the road, you then may have another three months and, and, and a buffer stock of a couple or three months. Down the road, you've got the district pharmacy. They ha may have three months plus a bit of buffer stock. At the end of the day, you may have something like 20 months of, of stock, of, of, and I call it working capital, I think the private sector will do as well, uh, in, in the system. And then we wonder why things expire when they get down to the, or they've got very, very small shelf life when it gets down to the, uh, down to the patient. So for me, one of the, uh, you know, if you want to move towards best practice, how about we move from three monthly replenishment down to monthly replenishment? Now, people hold their hands up in horror and say, oh, well, just think about all the transportation expenses. But also think about the um, expiration, but also think about the inventory carrying cost. For every million dollars worth of stock that you're holding, the inventory carrying cost of that is round about 12%. 10% of that is the heating, lighting, um, the, the wages, the forklift trucks, the building, the rent, etc. And... Uh, Two, two or three percent of that is what you could make if you didn't put that money into inventory and you had it in the bank. Now, um, a, a lot of countries don't, don't see it that way because they see this as free things coming into the country. Um, and I've noticed a lot of countries who use a two-tier system. With essential medicines, they'll be running like a one-month, two-week replenishment system. But with ours, it's like, bring it on in. Uh, and by the way, can you build us a warehouse as well? And, and so we've got to think about private sector mentality and, and, and the supply chain mentality, and that's all about flow. It's all about improvement of flow, getting it through like a bullet rather than having these big stocks. Now, the reason they've got big stocks at the moment is because there's uncertainty, uh, because in the past they've probably got burnt. They haven't had their deliveries uh, on time or something in, in that nature. Now, if that's the case, that's what we've got to be solving, but let's not say that we've got to hold all this stock. Let's, let's solve the, the, the fundamental root cause problems in the first place. I think the minister wanted to talk. <laughs> Thank you very much. <clears throat> I couldn't agree with you the more. Um, we run a system that was in parallel. Do not partners, we bring commodities, and we'll put them into a central medical source. And from there, distribution across the country was done along one public sector supply chain system. Private sector people do their own things. We are so fragmented. 
various uh, pharmacies and their partners outside from India to China to UK to Germany, all of them. So they have their own parallel lines for private sector issues. But for public sector, we had one single uh, supply chain thing until the fire outbreak in the central medical stores. Global Fund lost commodities. Defeat lost commodities. And it's like they lost confidence in the system. And that is the basis, the genesis of the reforms that we are doing. And I must tell you, we are doing what we are doing now, all the things that I mentioned earlier, together with these partners. So we are tapping into expertise. That is one aspect of collaboration we're talking about. And I've told Global Fund that we're not going to sit in Ghana for Global Fund to do procurement for Ghana. We should learn and get expertise and some experience and benefit from the aid that Ghana is getting. So bring in your people to play with us so we learn from them. And on exit, we may have acquired some new skills that we can use to run our systems efficiently, just as it's done anywhere else. So going forward, like I said, by next year, when we manage to get our systems right back with some confidence in us, uh, these power issues will be a matter of the past. So, so clearly, and, and, and I'll, I'll chime in, uh, there are indeed a variety of systems overlapping one another, duplication, and a lot of room of improvement, economies of scale, synergies. That, that, that obviously, that's what we understand. But the thing is, we all know that, but it's not happening. So why, which body would be the coordinating body? H how do we treat, so should it be at the global level? Should it be at the national level? Should it be disease specific? What is your perspective on that? It's, it's such a complex issue. You have a variety of procurement agency coming in and donors, and then you have to, to tackle with uh, private sector and then a variety of, of country specific stakeholder, warehouse, pharmacists, there's a variety of stakeholders. Where do we get them around the table to talk about that? How do we make sure that we're not only addressing that vertically? So Global Fund comes in, it's HIV, TB, malaria, nothing else. But where, where are the learnings across? So how do, we, how do we get into this kind of discussion? But not only discussing, but then turning it into implementation and sustainable differences. So I understand you have a public system and then a private one. Where do they speak? Which level should they speak? So so, anybody wants to shed some light on that? It's a very complex issue. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. Uh, do you want to, to go for it? And, we'll, we'll, and Philip, can you, yeah. Yeah. So, um, first of all, um, grateful that this is the way forward you, you want to go, so that you want to centralize this. Now, um, some colleagues from uh, some agencies are telling me, not, not in your country, obviously, but um, in some countries, that they lose confidence because all of a sudden boxes are missing. And then they say, well, we, you know, we procured this medicine. It's no longer there when we needed it. So there's a governance issue there as well, which we need to address. And this is you know, showing the example why this whole thing of, of supply chain is so interdisciplinary. We now need to bring in governance issues as well that we address why all of a sudden boxes are missing and how we build up the confidence and the trust in donors that they can actually contribute to this uh, central supply chain and um, having the warehouses together and still having the medicines that they procured in the end which all brings together the issue so your question should we have this disease specific or donor specific I would say no we should have it for the system so and definitely not for disease specific things because in the end you need a resilient health system which is dependent that you have the medicines you need for whatever disease you need it available at the pharmacy or at the doctor's office Yes, to come back on the, um, on the design of the supply chain and the barriers that we're facing and the next step for us. I mean, first of all, I would, I would agree that, you know, the most important is channels. It's not really to build the capability per, for one product. It doesn't make too much sense, honestly. It's really channels. Which population do you want to address? For which type of, of, of basically, uh, disease you want, to, uh, you want to fight and the best way to do that? So how do you build those channels, which at the end of the day, it's uh, the same pipeline for everybody, okay? 
we know in the industry that uh, we need to collaborate more. That, that, that's a given, okay, because it's getting far more complex and there are so many different actors that we need to collaborate more. At the same time, we do have legal constraints, okay? It's very, very difficult for us to share information, you know, within the same industry, and that's, there is lots of constraints there. And that's exactly why we're trying to, to build, you know, accessibility platform like this one here to get together to try to understand how can we try to understand standards, understand capability, understand benchmark, understand training, and, and to put a framework which is going to help us to build those pipelines for the long term. And I think we move away a long way from competition to co-petition. And co-petition for me is really you start to um, align yourself on all the, uh, the functions in the company which are not the primary function. I mean, supply chain is an enabler. So I think that's where you need to start to think about how can you put all the forces together to try to build a pipeline for the long term within the pharma industry, but not only within the pharma industry. I think we need to tap on solutions which already exist, of course, temperature control. I mean, the food industry has been doing that for many, many years. So we need to tap on those capabilities that are there. How can we work with them? which is challenging sometimes, even from the regulatory standpoint, okay? To put a drug and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and the food in the same house, that's just not allowed, okay? So that's, that's, there, there are constraints around that. But we need to come across those constraints and try to influence that to really make sure that we maximize the investment that we want to put in those countries to build those pipelines. I think, Honorable Jim Moon. Um, this idea of collaboration and um, single pipeline for supply chain and things like that, I sit back and also begin to get a bit confused. On your slides, you were talking about how many wholesalers in America. You said three of them. I understand Côte d'Ivoire has about five by the uh, policy. I don't know what happens in France. But you sit back and look at the number of manufacturers different drugs for different disease burdens. And in my country, you want to tell me how many wholesalers you be there for which drugs. I don't see how it works. I don't know, probably I need to be educated. You know, the Japanese has a system where they have big wholesalers for almost all manufacturers. But even there, those who are doing automobiles wouldn't combine with medicines. So you will have parallel systems running based on commodities. But if you put yourself into medicines, I wouldn't know how many are picking all the production from all the manufacturers for distribution. I think that would be a complex, complex issue. Probably I need some education. So can I take that one as well? So um, I love this. Oh, sorry. So Christina, please go ahead. And I'm sure Manfred wants to build upon that. Thank you. I think that's a perfect example, actually. Um, we do have um, experience in other countries and, and as well in Ghana. So cases like Kenya, we, we did engage into a public-private uh, partnership uh, by which um, not only we look into access and, and improving you know, the um, uh, screening, the awareness, the diagnosis, but also we, we took the opportunity to remodel the value chain. So one specific example was for um, uh, a tailored solution for a concrete product uh, which required cold chain, which required as well really looking into safety, into integrity, we developed a lean supply chain uh, going directly to a specific warehouse or even hospital. So I think that's a very valid question and, and we need to understand each country is different. There's no one fits all. And even within the country, there's different uh, products. There's products which require ambience, there's products which require cold chain. So how do we serve best the needs of your country? With whom do we need to partner? It's um, about the number, but also in terms of the number of layers or number of distributors, this impacts the final price to patient, the markup. So this is a key challenge to, to, to resolve. But also, who has the capabilities? So we also look very much into, and this is where the private sector can help, bringing that expertise, that uh, skill set, so saying who's, who has the capabilities to deal with pharma products, with coaching management? How do we help them? Uh, how do we bring them up to speed through training? So it's a very valid question, but I think it's a key role as well from the private sector. Manfred, if you've got... Yeah, absolutely. I wanted to add on this. We can really provide as the, out of the accessibility platform training and expertise. We heard so many times now the word complex. 
So to manage this complexity and hopefully reduce the complexity, we also need to understand the issues and this starts with training and education. And that is something we want to deliver on the ground, be it in symposia or at the free of charge training at universities. Uh, and I think this is a prerequisite which we need to further develop and foster in all emerging uh, markets. So that is something where we can collaborate immediately. We don't have any restrictions from legal perspective. And I think that is something a strength the uh, private industry can uh, bring clearly. Thank you very much. Martin, please. And then I'll, yeah, I, I will, yeah revert to the public where I think there's a, a quite a few questions I would expect you to have in mind. So, so Martin, so just out of politeness. <laughs> just uh, just to, to finish off um, on the point that the Minister made. Um, I, I guess uh, one of the answers I would give you is, is, is uh, to your, uh, your question about the complexities of, uh, of the different programs is that um, that's what supply chain specialists do. Um, that, that's their job. So for, for, for instance, um, I was in uh, Rwanda between 2009 2011 and uh, they had uh, they sent me in um, as, a, as a PEPFAR consultant at the time and it was uh, so that, that obviously they're thinking HIV they're thinking uh, um, AIDS um, and they wanted me to put uh, what they called an active distribution system in uh, they wanted me to change the collection system of the district pharmacies going to the central warehouse um, into into a delivery system and uh, the way that uh, I, I, I viewed it and when I went in there, and, and something I, I totally advocate now, is that uh, I decided that I would become totally product and program agnostic. I, I didn't care which program it was, whether it was essential medicines, whether it was TB, HIV, malaria, didn't care, um, and even faith-based. I even brought in faith-based as well. And what we did is we turned a three-monthly collection system into a monthly delivery system and we coordinated that all from the central stores. So it, it, it is possible, it's just that you've got to have the mindset and you've got to have the supply chain expertise in the product planning, in the capacity planning, the capability planning, um, understanding how to turn our orders into, in, into, into shipping notes, etc. But if you get those, those, uh, those specialists in, uh, if you tell them the characteristics, so you were saying earlier uh, about cold chain, we did cold chain as well. So, for a logistics expert, they don't need to know the, the product makeup. You need, you need pharmacists in there for the, for the quality control, obviously. But uh, you know, if you give a logistician, supply chain expert, if you tell them that you need, either need one or a thousand, that you, need either st you, know, you've, you understand it's either going to be stable demand or stochastic demand, that it's fragile or not fragile, it needs cold chain or it doesn't need cold chain. These are what supply chain uh, you know, geeks love. You know, and they, they, they so call this up. And, and, they, and they make it happen. But you, you know, if you looked at if you look at uh, Boots, the chemist in the UK, or, or, or uh, any other of these private sector companies, uh, they are agnostic to, to, to the, the product. Uh, they, they are they are moving boxes basically. So before we, we keep on on this discussion around uh, this amazing challenge that uh, in health it seems like we, we keep on being very vertical and, and it's disease specific. Why? Often it's because it's tied to funding and the funding goes to a disease, doesn't go to a non-disease area. So, uh, and, and this ambition of a, a centralized agnostic system pretty close to the commodity supply chain. So that's something I like to keep on having a discussion. But before that, I know we have a few questions in, in, the, in the room G and a gentleman over there and the lady over there. Okay, good. So, we'll start with you. Would you mind introducing yourself? Uh, Jan Willem Schijgrond from uh, Philips. Um, I'm puzzled. You, s you asked a very clear question, and all five of you ducked the question, or all six of you. I no, love the so, Dutch. Right? Sorry, sorry for being blunt, but uh, you're, you've asked the question, who orchestrates this? The private sector Dorm. went at length to say, well, we have good things to actually offer, but clearly the private sector is not the ones to orchestrate. You have the WHO and the Global Fund who have the power to orchestrate or support the orchestrator, but didn't offer that. And then the Minister of Health says, well, I need to be educated, but I will not orchestrate. So I think we have a responsibility problem here to actually scale. Private sector is often an afterthought. The government and the donors, Global Fund and the WHO, know very well what the problem is and articulate that very, very well. When it comes to finding the solution, we have Novartis and Roche sitting there. We actually understand this complexity. Yeah. 
but they're being brought in at the wrong time. Uh, Global Fund, you just said, I first want to sort out some issues and then I bring in the private sector. No. Ask the private sector to sort out your issues before you implement the, the, the fixes, which will later on turn to be um, you know, obsolete. So I think there's a radical change. I think the Minister of Health should say, I am the orchestrator, and this is what I need to orchestrate beautifully. It's a very good point. So any answer to that? So it's, it's absolutely right. So, and, and who has the legitimacy? Who has the responsibility to do that? And we still don't know. But that's something we need to address. So if I'm, please do chime in. Please step up. So politicians are supposed to listen. <laughs> and I think I'll take note of what you have said. <laughs> Thank you. Um, it's not difficult for us to do. You need legislation and public policy to drive some of these things. You know, but when you sit and you also want to look at um, uh, collaborating with stakeholders and you need to bring private sector on board, there are certain things that you do, certain policies you come up with. Without private sector, you will get it wrong. Its implementation will not be very efficient. And that is where you have foreseen some resistance know from the private sector we are playing certain roles that you want to take away from them so it's still a problem that should be managed but i think that government should take the lead role and play it very very well with um how do i call it uh, expertise from private sector those who are very well endowed in that area and then we'll see how best we can move forward Thank you. Just to keep on echoing your, your comment, which we, we take very seriously, uh, we have had a discussion around that. So who's a coordinator? Very difficult. You don't have an international institution taking place of taking care of delivery. So you need to work with a, a variety of stakeholders. I will ask WHO. And the key thing when we, you speak about that, the key response you get is just, okay, we'll implement regulation. And you know how the private industry is not, we are, all, pharmaceutical industry is already highly regulated. So what we call for is not regulation, is an enabling environment in order to do our job, where we can make a difference, and incentives to invest. Regulation may support that, but if we start with regulation, this is probably not where we want to go. But anyway, so I'm going to turn to WHO, and ask, it's a normative, as we know, body, but we ask them what is the role in coordinating, and that's a very fair question. So I'm, I'm asking Rudiger. So, um, have I got it right here from the Netherlands? Yeah. Very good. So, just imagine we as WHO would now say uh, we're regulating, uh, we're um, coordinating the supply chain for the Netherlands. What would you say? Yes. You would say yes? yes? Ask us. That's the point. If we're not asked, we're not going into Den Haag and do it. Right? And uh, sometimes there's a misunderstanding that just because it's um, Burundi, we think we can do it. And we can't. And we will not. Unless we are asked to do it. Anybody? Otherwise, I know I've got other questions. Thank you. I think also it's, uh, we need to keep in mind the bigger picture and the sustainability. So again, it's not a matter of coming short term, fix, quick fixes. We, we need to think how do we build local capabilities how do we bring that up to speed? And each country should have a sustainable long-term solutions as well. And respectful of sovereignty of national countries, absolutely. I think I've got other questions. Becoming very interesting, thank you. The lady, ladies first. <laughs> okay, I'll just cut out. Hi, my name is Hold on, anybody can provide a microphone? That would be lovely, thank you. Can you hear? Can we have the mic on, oh, please? Now it's on. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so I'm really interested in access to health and market access. But from what I've seen in this conference so far, there seems to be a lot of mistrust placed in pharmaceutical companies from the public sector. And I think from what I've gained so far, it's hindering access to health as I see it. So I think I'd direct my question to Dr. Manfred, since you're um, the head of partner collaborations. 
Do you, do you see this in the industry? Do you see that public sector isn't really willing to collaborate with the private sector? And do you think that this is damaging, um, for example, the successful implementation of public-private partnerships? So I repeat, I clearly see a responsibility and a role for the private industry to help and to educate. And I have seen many uh, functioning interventions already. So overall, I don't see this mistrust from uh, the other uh, organizations in the room here. So I think we, there is an opportunity and we can really start to do this even in, at a greater scale. But yeah, of course, we also need to be asked. We cannot go and deliver what we think is necessary. We should hear from the countries and from the universities and from the other bodies what they need, and then we offer our support. If I, if I can just chime in on that, and then I'll ask Christina. The perspective we have of the industry is indeed we don't want to push for solution. We want to be needs driven. So we want to have a dialogue with the stakeholders and if they have a need and we can fulfill the need, then we'll come in. So it's, and it's true, it's about building relationship and trust. We, we don't have the best trust relation and I don't think it's, 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 it's for any bad reasons because we don't know one another. And just five years ago, this kind of discussion would not take place. So we, we, we need to learn about one another. We need to get to know one another. Dialogue is critically important. We need to start slow and just build up. And this kind of dialogue, we intend to meet afterwards and start just discussing how we're going to work together. Let's start together. But I agree with you. There's a mistrust with the private industry and we, we, we're willing to, to support, but we wait for, for, we don't want to be pushing for our drugs, our solution. We really want to be a true partner. So, and it takes time to learn and, and get, so this is a very good question. Christina, from your perspective. I think it's also, this is shifting, so um, it might be um, this perception as well, but we do have some examples already where we're getting, um, uh, you know, uh, requested by governments uh, and through memorandum of understanding, we're looking into, linking to market access, not just supply chain, we're looking into as well, uh, working in improving awareness, working in improving diagnostics, funding and healthcare capacity. And within healthcare capacities, today we're speaking about supply chain, which is one element, but we're seeing this push from, from the governments. And, and we gave some examples as well in Kenya. We also have in Ivory Coast. We also have in other countries, um, Sudan. So this is happening. Again, the push has to come from the countries and say, how can we best work together in addressing all those access hurdles? From supply chain as well, we can have the perfect supply chain, but if we do not have address, we don't have a, the right machine to do the right diagnostic test, it will not help. If we don't have the right, um, let's say, all the patients, they're aware they need to go to the hospital, this will not help. So uh, in Roche, we specifically take this systematic approach in, in looking into these four pillars. And uh, again, repeating this awareness, diagnosis, healthcare capacity, and funding. So it's changing. And hopefully we should see more in the coming years. Probably this answer, yeah. And, and from the private sector, what, our commitment is to support supply chain, non-disease and non-product specific. So we will not fall into the trap of misconstruing that we do that only because we are pushing for our products. It's very much about being there to build the capacity mm -hmm. and then after the business will come in. But if we don't have the capacity in country, we will never get the business. And we do agree on that. So we have an alignment that it's not going to be, dis we are going to develop support capacity, which is non-disease specific, in order to build up this trust and relationship and really make a difference, we hope. Can I, from your perspective, from a country perspective, what do you think about this commitment we make that we, want, we, we are willing to, and we stand ready to, to help when needs is and, and as you wish us to, comp to partner with you? When two partners um, are at play, there is always one that seems stronger than the other. For us in low middle income countries, some donors are more powerful than us. So we don't engage at equal level playgrounds. They hold what it takes to try to influence certain decisions along the line. But where they demonstrate ample evidence of efficiency, skills, knowledge, you begin to play ball. And no matter what conditions they set for you. At times, certain timelines are highly unrealistic. But because you need support, 
you sign on to it. And along the line, it's like, you can't have access to this, you can't have access to that. Then the whole program that you're running begins to begin to look at, you know, begins to become wavering and things like that. So, yes, these mistrust and confidence issues are there. They are very real when you're playing you know, partnership games, you know. But um, these are part of the complexities you need to manage. A bit psychological. I mean, you need certain things to be done. You have accepted that these are the most efficient way that you can go. And therefore, you also have to push up, push up yourself to try to see you at the receiving end um, will have access to certain um, support instruments and also get to achieve what you want to achieve with a program that you're running. They are real, but they are manageable. Thank you so much. What I can, what I can, uh, I can say is just obviously there's value of perspective. And when you talk about collaboration, the thing is w everybody has a role to play. But by the end of the day, what is, how do you measure, measure success? What, what is success in your mind? And then when you, I will ask a few of them, what is success? You realize we have different ways of assessing success. And that's probably a way as well. We will need to address what success looks like individually, but also collaboratively. And then it might help us drive the collaboration because success for private industry or success for WHO is probably very different. And we need to find out how, wh what is your end objective and what success looks like together. Can I, can I ask you to, to chime in on that? Yes, indeed. And, and success for us looks like if people have access to the medicines they need. So that's, universal health coverage is exactly around this and we want to be measured by our impacts. So what sort of impact do we have by actually offering the, um, uh, the ways that people receive this access? And so therefore, thank you very much uh, to, for your question on how do we see the, in the interplay of public and private. Now let's be serious. Hundreds of millions of people do not currently have access to the medicines they need, right? And we cannot do this alone. We cannot do this with the public sector alone. We need the private industry for that. And we need a good functioning pharmaceutical industry for this. Now, we are offering a new business model for uh, engaging with the pharmaceutical industry. And therefore, I'm... I'm very, very grateful to the government of the Netherlands again, <laughs> because they have, together with us, started the pricing forum. Because what we have to see and acknowledge is that a lot of uh, medicines are far too expensive if we really want to include this access to everybody in the rural areas, in the villages, also in your country. But at the same time, some medicines have become much too cheap, and that is because we procured them together and pushed the industry perhaps too much. So therefore, we need a different debate around pricing at the same time as we're talking about the supply chain, because it's not all about pricing, but pricing is a big factor in this. So while we see that through our collaboration with you, Minister, and other ministers, through the collaboration we have with other stakeholders, and the potential that we also have in bringing things together, we offer also much better access to such medicines, but on the prerequisite and condition that we're at the same time looking at the pricing and be more transparent in this. Thank you very much. Can I take another question in the audience? Elderly first. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> and then I'll ask you. Hold on, hold on. I'll give my, keep, keep the microphone over there. The gentleman will come after. Thank you very much. Can you introduce uh, yourself? Yes. My name is Lim Kirki. I was born in Cambodia. I was a refugee. I have advice. I was Minister of Health, myself, I have advised the ministers, and um, I went back home, I come back, I live, I'm going to live and die in my country. I'm addressing to you as a layman, not a health professional. So forgive me when the word is too crude from a layman. 
I have served you, uh, the World Health Organization in Manila, for 13 years. I failed. That's how I come here. Uh, it took time for uh, the World Health Organization to take care of uh, non-communicable disease. When I went to your representative in Phnom Penh, he was just submerged from malaria. Uh, I come back uh, on why. I went to, say, to tell him I'm so interested in non-communicable disease. For malaria, you treat well, he's cured. You don't treat well, he dies. It's finished in a short time. In non-communicable disease, I'm suffering it myself. I will not die. I will be miserable all my time. And then I will be, I will die not of diabetes, of the consequence of diabetes. My question is, now ministry, uh, uh, WHO is standing up, World uh, Global Fund has the money, ministry, a minister of Ghana, I'm admiring you. I have never known you, but I've heard so much. What is your question? My question, go to teach all your colleagues, not only in Africa, in the Southeast Asia region. These are combined. The ultimate goal of what you are doing is what? Patient. Don't go through contractors just go directly to the patient. That's all I would like to say. Thank you. I think the question is very relevant. Where, how you bring the learnings from one best practice, scale it up, replicate. So we're not only addressing Africa, we're talking about all of low income countries, emerging 107 countries, ATM would tell that. Uh, so where are the learnings? WH Rudiger, could you give us a sense of how you scale up? And I'll ask you as well. Best practices, that's something we wanted, I wanted to ask uh, my colleagues. Give us an example of a pilot, a best practice, and what are your ambitions in terms of scaling up, replicating? And we need to do that, otherwise it will be a series of pilots, pilotitis, and it will not make an impact. So, your question was yours, so where are, so I guess, what is the div dividing line between communicable disease and non-communicable disease, particularly in supply chain area, and then what are the area for opportunities for scaling up and replication, learnings? Yeah. So, uh, f first of all, um, there's this project Tetius, it's true, right? So you have lots of pilots and then uh, you end these pilots and then you go on Start with something else. One. And that's again to do with how these pilots are funded, by the way. So what we're trying to do is to analyze the learnings and bring, up, bring, bring it up to scale. Um, and again, I think what we're analyzing, and thank you very much for, um, um, for your compliment that we're analyzing obviously the problems well, is, is then to offer what are the key components now. And I think the discussion shows that we're, we're, we've identified key some, some, some key learnings from there. Now the point will be how do we, on the one hand, hand, look at what are the key components, but how do we apply them to the country and district and local context? So what I would say, call global. So it's, it's really to see what are the big issues, but how do I apply them so that they are actually uh, useful at the local level? And that is much more complex than we think. Philip. Yes, I can follow up obviously with a, with a very, very good example of one of the pilots which was quite successful and looked at the, uh, the history uh, of that pilot. I'm talking about um, an initiative which is called SMS for Life. 
that uh, Novartis in fact de developed. Uh, it was the um, basically the, um, the social business to develop that solution, and we're using new technology, obviously, which is just the mobile to collect information about you know the level of inventory, of course, uh, in the rural areas, and making sure that this information goes back, of course, to the central level for replenishment. So SMS for Life was launched uh, for a single um, disease, which was malaria, obviously, in 2009 in, Tan in Tanzania. And it has been, obviously, very, very successful because it's a very simple solution, okay? So it's, and you can implement it straight away. And to, go, and to going back to the technology, that's where, you know, new technology can help us to really go, go after, you know, a solution which are perhaps very, very different than the one we had. So a very successful pilot, and we are basically ramping up that pilot in different countries, but at the same time, not a single disease. So now it becomes, you know, very, very much many different diseases to do exactly the same, stock out. What strikes me when I looked at the opportunity and the initiative is also the fact that now it's not just about stock count. It's about also, you know, information about basically disease monitoring. So, you know, when you are talking about efficiency, I can look at efficiency of supply chain in terms of you know, service levels, in terms of number of stockouts, but I would miss the point. The point is, do I treat patient well? Do I have the information to do it? So that's a very good example where you go beyond the normal KPIs and you looked at the impact on healthcare locally with information about disease monitoring and disease surveillance with the same tool. Now we're going to the next step. Okay? It's not just a mobile, it's, a, it's a basically a tablet, and we start to use the same tool for education to start to make sure that we can bring education, of course, in rural areas to try to connect the dots. So this is showing typically an example where on the last miles, the private sector, we have pilots running well and very efficient. The key question is, how do we do to make sure that this is not just a Novartis initiative, but this is an initiative which is going to be embraced by different you know, partners and try to get the, the standard of the future for those countries? And that's a challenge for us still today. Oh, thank you. Direct to patient is an impossibility. Direct to patient is an impossibility. Governments around the globe have tried with free health years. Then the realization was that government couldn't do it alone across the globe. So new strategies, innovative ways of providing health service to people came through and financing health insurance has become the model across the globe. Along all these things, government cannot procure, train health workers, pay them, put them into facilities, and then government itself distributes along the supply chain to provide medicines. Government would try to stock hospitals, but if you have got prescription from a hospital, and you should buy from outside, you should go and collect from a pharmacist, you will meet government there as well. Definitely some private sector people will have to have a role to play. And mind you, in every economy, government would employ everybody. So we will definitely have to spend to enable private sector also to operate, saying that in times of need, government can get to private sector for support as well. So government direct to patients, um, my view, it's an impossibility. Share experiences and talking to other ministers and other jurisdictions, fine. But as to whether they will listen and do whatever it is to do to be done. Now, our major objective, all of us sitting here, WHO, Global Fund, French government, Netherlands, everybody, we have signed on to what we call the Investor Health Coverage. SDGs are telling us that everybody should have access to health. And so it's our responsibility as governments to ensure that these cliches become workable. How do we do it? When we don't perform well and governance systems are just bad and our economies are not growing and we are not doing big GDPs and say that we can have investments on our own, forget. And I'm beginning to dream that it is these concepts, access to health, investor health coverage, that may drive a global shift from low poor countries to everybody coming onto a pedestal. Because the reality now is that each country should put itself in a position where we can provide health. Other than that, forget about SDG3 and its goals. Simple as this. Because if you can't procure, if you can't provide infrastructure to do health, if you can't support your citizens to assess, there's nothing you can do. 
We're talking about non-communicable diseases. So far, either bilateral or multilateral countries, none is supporting any poor country to do NCDs. Global Fund is picking malaria. In my country, Ghana, at times we get more malaria, but, I mean, medications, to the extent that some expire, we throw them away. Meanwhile, nobody helps with cancer, any type of cancer. Right? Even my own system, our health insurance system that we run, some types of cancers, majority of it, are not listed on the benefits package. So if you are afflicted with that type of disease burden, you should pay yourself. Kidney dialysis is not covered. The um, end of it. So you see people going for dialysis, and they are paying through the roof themselves. So they are dying. And Global Fund doesn't do that. I don't know WHO, which country does that for their citizens. And that is an area, if you seriously are looking for access to health, we have to look at. Now, NCDs are becoming the, a commonplace binarity in developing economies, especially in Africa. Meanwhile, we don't have what it takes to support people to go for care. And these are areas WHO and those who have the money to do, we have to look at. But I believe that it is time now for the rest of the world to look at how we can influence, we can instill on governments to perform, such that we have transparency, good governance, economies are doing well, all of us have money to invest, and we can continue relying on anybody for any support. Thank you. So to continue here, I think um, we have actually the unique opportunity now to collaborate. So already having this panel here, we all have different expertise and we all have a role to play here. So there's no excuse again to not to do anything. It's not just about saying, you know, blaming each other. It's, it's a very silo thinking. That's why we're here today. Ultimately, how can we best collaborate? How can we best leverage our expertise towards serving the patient? That's our clear mandate. Impact, how do we measure the number of patients we can treat? But ultimately, again, there's not one organization who can solve everything. And that's the first purpose. Even in my role, I'm, I'm coming from supply chain, so I had to speed up and really understand, okay, what are my commercial colleagues do? What do they need from me? Why are we talking about market access? What, what's going on there? So my obligation was to really understand how can I best serve? How can I connect the dots? How can I bring all these parties together so that we increase access to affordable, quality, and safe medicines? So I think it's up to us. Again, it's, it's not just one role. There's an overarching as well body, fully agree with that, governance, we need rules of the game, but we all have a role to play. Again, critical examples. We do have examples now um, where, again, in these countries where we, thanks to a collaboration between the government and the private sector, patients didn't need to pay anything for the medicine. This is starting. I come from a country where even um, health is, is, is for free. And then I'm living in another country where I have to pay my insurance. So, but then I had to leave as well and, and travel to Africa, and, and I was shocked when I learned, wow, 95% of the people, they pay out of their pocket. There's no way I could pay myself that treatment. So I fully understand that. And again, it's our role to find solutions, innovative solutions. How do we partner? What is, how do we find reimbursement? How do the insurance come in? How does supply chain support? And again, I'm, I'm putting a hat here outside my expertise. But I do see our role is all different parties within, outside the organization and within our own companies to make sure we work towards the same goal. I'm sure you will agree with me that we have very passionate people and we all share the same dream. So now it's about to make it real. And it's often not because we don't want to, it's just we don't even know which door to knock on to. So it's, it's about starting the dialogue and, 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 and work together. C obviously critical point, there is no global fund for NCDs. So how are we going to finance that? How is it going to work out? There's been a lot of discussion of creating a global fund for NCDs, but it's still not getting there. So how we get there? So there's a lot of inter, in, 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 inter created questions. But anyway, I know that this gentleman wants to ask a question, and now I will, I will ask all of you, please, let's now, I, I think we should open up probably one last question from Martin after your question, and then I'd like to open up to everybody. Gentlemen? Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, my name is Harry. I come from Greece, and I'm also a master's student uh, in uh, the University of Innsbruck, Austria, focusing on health economics and management. Uh, throughout my studies, uh, what I have learned is that 
the only one of the ways to improve access to healthcare, provide a good supply chain of medicine, and deliver healthcare eventually to patients, is to have a proper base of good health evaluation. It's quite unfortunate that none out of you all seven mentioned anything about it. You mentioned only that we miss data. It's not only that we miss data, we do not know how to evaluate them and interpret them in a proper way. It's at least threatening and alarming that we apply diagnostic procedures such as ICD-10, which are primarily uh, designed for people coming from the Western industrialized world to people from sub-Saharan Africa who belong in a developing world. And we use them to evaluate aspects of their health, such as the mental health care ones, and the whole supply chain sometimes fails because there are cases which they were diagnosed, people were diagnosed with schizophrenia and they only had a personality disorder. Uh, don't you think that it's finally time now that technology has evolved, innovation is fledging, according to me, obviously, to create additional procedures, measures, that can evaluate health not only regionally, let's say Europe, let's say Asia, let's say Africa, but also in specific regions like the Balkans, like Northern Europe, like Northeastern Asia, like South Africa. That was my question. This is a very good question you're asking. There's no doubt about that. Monitoring, evaluation, what constitutes uh, outcome or impact, absolutely. This is part of the, the thinking. So I want to just highlight that WHO has kick-started a high-level commission on health, employment, and economic growth in collaboration with the international level organization as well as OECD. And they are working on making sure that the workforce is trained and we need to invest. This is not a cost, it is an investment for the healthcare systems of the future and for emerging market. Can I ask you, Rudiger, to probably provide some perspective? Sure. Um, <clears throat> the, first of all, we have a, a big challenge in front of us because um, there is a huge shortage of health personnel already now, and we estimate that this shortage will increase over the next 15 years, so therefore um, we have a big problem. Now, on the other side, um, there's a lot of opportunities as well, because health is a driving force. It's one of the biggest economic markets already now. It's going to grow. Um, and there's also a lot of uh, incentives for people to move around. So the issue of migration is there. So um, when I look at the issue of supply chain, and that's where we can then bring this in, is that we need um, to, to better understand where the challenges are with regard to the health workforce, so that we're again not creating parallel processes there, but that we're integrating them. Let me just come back to the question of, of the gentleman about um, monitoring. Um, uh, of course, we, we do monitoring, uh, we do monitor um, mobility overall, and we do monitor um, uh, health outcomes overall. Um, the ICD, the International Classification of Disease, in its issue 10 that you quoted, um, is, is how we actually understand disease, right? So that's why then we also look at what does this mean in, with regard to incidence and prevalence rates. Um, we do also, uh, but not systematically, get evidence of um, iatrogenic diseases, of misconduct in the health workforce, uh, which I think you alluded to, if I understood you co correctly. But um, there is not such a thing of a global database so far that we could say um, how, how much misconduct in the health personnel has, has, um, has arisen. So that's an, another thing we need to think about, whether that would be useful for public health impact that we, we want to have. Thank you. I'd like to ask Martin, uh, Martin Global Fund. Global Fund is, is initially, was initially a, a financing mechanism and has evolved and learned a lot. So what I want to, to, to convey here is just 
we are learning and learning is important. So if you could share with us a bit of a background on how the Global Fund, where it ca came from and where you are now and how you're tackling this issue of combining first mile to last mile and potentially how the Global Fund could be a m platform beyond communicable disease into the broader perspective of how do we tackle that, I would really appreciate. And then I'll come back to the public for questions. Yes, thank you. So uh, I think one, one of the participants here said, that uh, Global Fund knows the answers. Um, I, I can assure you we don't know all the answers, but we're, we're, we're trying. And um, uh, as, as Frederick just said, um, yes, we will, uh, we have been, and we will always be known as a financial mechanism. So we get the monies in uh, from the, the various countries, uh, the, the tax dollars, the tax pounds, the tax euros, the tax uh, whatever. And we, we do replenishments every three years. And, um, and then we, and it, it, the sum is around about 13 billion. So every, every year we, we dispense about 4 billion to a, a circa 120 countries. And, we, we, and they go, that, that money goes to principal recipients. And, and, and there's a, we have a big trust there because uh, we, we hand that over to the principal recipient. They are in charge uh, of, of procurement and of, of supply chain. So uh, that's how it, it, it used to be. Uh, we then found that there, sometimes uh, the, the money uh, wasn't uh, always efficiently um, uh, spent, uh, lack of economies of scale, etc. Um, and so we then um, added a sourcing department to the... To the um, Global Fund a few years ago, and they did a great job of improving the way that the, the commodities then got into country to the port of entry and the, into the central stores. And, uh, and, and that, that then was, for, for a long time, the end of it. We, we, that, that's, uh, that's all we did. And then there was a number of uh, officer, uh, the Office for Inspector General reports coming in from countries, and there was a very large thematic report that all indicated that, uh, again, once the commodities were in the central warehouse, they weren't always effectively uh, uh, sent down, down the chain uh, through the regional, district, uh, health facility, and sometimes community worker uh, supply chains. Um, hence, um, in 2016, a year ago, uh, on August the 1st, I then um, founded the, the, the supply chain department. Uh, we've come a long way since then, I think. We've, uh, in, in, that, in that what feels a short year, we've developed a supply chain strategy for, for, the, for the Global Fund. Uh, we've also got catalytic funding that's been ceded to us to do diagnostics in countries, to, uh, to look at innovation and also to look at capacity building as well. So we are in this evolving situation, and I think it's because people are really waking up and realizing how important supply chain is. And again, I think that's the reason why we're here today, because I understand this is the first time that the Supply Chain Forum uh, has, has been in front of the World Health Summit. So I think there's this slow realisation and build-up. And they say Rome doesn't, you know, wasn't created in a day, and certainly fixing 120 supply chains around the world is going to take some time. I'll take questions. Ladies first. <laughs> and then you next. Dr. Adrian Cousy. Um, I have a question towards, you've been talking about a um, highly regulated pharma market, and at the other side, you have medication, which is swamping the global south, but not only the global south, um, which has no working agent. Um, in which way do you see the private sector, we've been talking about the private sector, that it has a relevant role to play to procuring and um, keeping up the supply chain. But at the same time, it also has its downfalls. So if we're looking at especially medication, which is too cheap, for example, to actually make a profit, where does the public sector come in? When do we start to actually say, okay, we have this medication, these are the essential medicines, and we need a global agent to actually produce them and actually supply and make sure that we always have these medications and they're not up for the discussion if they make a profit or not. Anybody? In? Thank you, Evelyn. There is some regulation on the pharma market, at least on standards and quality, and they are monitored. We have inspections in the field who make sure 
that what people are selling are there. The private sector syndrome. See, there are private individuals who have been licensed to manufacture drugs across the globe, even in my country, Ghana, India, China, wherever, Germany. Now, they are competing with themselves. Government can procure, or government procures from private sector, because I don't think any government now in Europe um, manufactures drugs to the extent that Global Fund will only buy from the German government facility. No. Roche, Bosch, whatever companies that you can have. Glaxo, they are all private sector enclaves. And they are the big time producers that governments procure from, donor partners procure from. My country, we have pharmacists who are large. Some own manufacturing plants, collaborating with people from India and Russia and everywhere. They have their own channels. So from their own manufacturing plant to their own wholesale outlets, to their own retail outlets, based on which parts of the country where demand for their products are, I don't see what regulation can stop them from doing their business. All you can do is monitor quality standards. But as to availability, you can use regulation to ensure that one particular producer will put his drug in a particular corner of a country for you. And that is where government comes in. And that is where we need to enhance our own supply chain systems. So that if you are flowing very efficiently, they can ride on your back as well. If our systems are okay, they can ride on your back. And I believe getting things done the most efficient way will have to start from government. The private sector is all interested in some profits that he's making. They may have corporate responsibilities to society. Some of them are doing quite well. They will do that. But definitely, they wouldn't put their fence where they cannot sell. Definitely, they wouldn't put their fence where their profit margins will be virtually zero or negative for them to make losses. And regulation cannot stop them from making their money. I'm stepping out of my moderator world, world, role. I'm, 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 I'm working for Merck, a German pharmaceutical company. On that, it's a very good question. I think you're raising the question of local manufacturing capacity. And if you're an economist, you think of comparative advantages. There's no point in having a, a manufacturing in every country. You need to have the best one to supply others. Otherwise, you end up with manufacturing by its lower quality. And I think patients need, uh, deserve the best quality possible. So I'm an economist by training. But at the same time, we do find ourselves in a situation where the market doesn't have the right incentives for the right manufacturing and supply system, in which case we need to think of innovative schemes, potentially it's a partnership with the governments and the third party where everybody brings something and takes the same risk or shared risk in order to provide a needed solution. And it could be financial, it can be legal, it can be responsibility, but this is the kind of thing we need to start thinking about. Just we all have roles and responsibility, we all have accountability, but there's an area where we can together by sharing the risk find new innovative bundles by which we can invest. Obviously, we're talking about R&D, uh, the pharmaceutical R&D based for industry, but there's also the generics, there's local industry, and we, we, we need to think about this kind of thing. So I think it's a very good question, and we need to start trusting one another in order to come with these innovative risk-sharing models, whether it's in supply chain or manufacturing or anything. So I absolutely agree with you. And we are starting to do this kind of thing. We are testing some new models. It's a very good question. I think Manfred has a follow-up, and I'll, I've got this gentleman. Thank you. I just would like to add a few sentences to this point. So first of all, I think we should not ask anybody to produce below his cost. This is not sustainable. There must always be a fair margin on products. Everything else is just dreaming. So everybody wants to have a outcome on this world. Second, we certainly have to develop the local market and the capabilities uh, of the local market. And this goes along with the business case. There must be an opportunity. And from this point of view, perhaps continuing with donations is not the right thing to do always. Of course, donations have their role in disaster relief. But if you continue to always donate, you will 
destroy the development of a local market opportunity. So from this point of view, we have to also foster the possibilities of locals to get into the business. It may start with uh, packaging, it may start with good distribution, but may end also with simple production for complex products as Frederic already lined out. It, there is no economies of scale and we are just wasting money. Thank you. Gentlemen, please introduce yourself. Thank you. I'm Serge Heinen. I'm from uh, iPlus Solutions. Um, I'm, from, I'm from the Netherlands, and to make it even more complex, I've also been recently to, uh, to Burundi uh, to, uh, to find out in uh, there what was, was going on in the supply chain in there. And I, I do would like to underscore some of the, uh, the points that were made, both by Dr. Krach about the, uh, the importance of the human resources in health, uh, as well as Dr. By, by Dr. Ellis about the power of, of information. Um, when, when going to a local facility, um, very poor area, 20,000 of, uh, of population in, uh, in there, no electricity, um, no water, running water. Um, you met a lady there who was the chief nurse. She had 12 other nurses and she has six ancillary staff. Yeah? She's responsible for um, doing the medical yeah? uh, 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 supervision of it, but also she's responsible to manage the pharmacy in uh, that sense. And she has also to write all these forms which are in there. Yeah? Stock at the beginning of the month, then so much was gone out, then we have to stock at the end of the month. Now, if you take a sample of um, what, is, what is in those reports, and, and I took a couple of samples and a number of these, you see immediately from the 10 figures there that are there, seven are wrong. Yeah? Uh, that underscores the, the importance of information systems in, uh, in there. Yeah? The, this lady, she's responsible to do that, mandatory to write that every month. She doesn't even have a calculator in, uh, for doing it. So mistakes are everywhere in the reports. Uh, so how can... On the basis of those reports, how can you do proper forecasting and how can you do proper quantification of needs on there? Um, so that's, that's an argument which I strongly support. Uh, maybe too much the details or the discussions have been about the financing and the transaction of financing or the transaction of goods. It's also about the transaction of information now, right? Um, it's also, uh, we've talked about this, this coordination of things. There are examples now that the ministries of health in countries have forced basically the donors by saying, I would like you to work together in a common information system in this. It's unacceptable that in my territory, um, I don't know what is, what is going on, and I would like to have this insight in, uh, in there. So this donor coordination is also something, an agenda that we should pursue on that. Uh, what I'm saying is it can only happen, these type of information systems, under the clear guidance of a government who says, I'm committed to solve some of these issues in the supply chain, for the better sake of my patients and also for the better sake of the healthcare workers there. Thank you. Do you have a question? I don't. <laughs> Thank you. That was my feeling as well. But we all, yes, we absolutely agree. There are not enough data and the, the, the quality of the data is not the right one either. So we need to improve on that in order to make informed decision making in very resource constrained. Uh, and, yeah, absolutely. Can, can and that's I, probably I? where SMS for Life is one of the key examples of a simple solution to trace this kind of inventory issues. And Martin, please chime in. Just, just, just one point on that, because I, I, I totally agree with this, this difficulty. Um, I, I know that labour doesn't, um, is, is, you know, doesn't come cheap, but uh, certainly um, I, I, I like the system that I saw in, in, in Malawi, where they were training up um, uh, supply chain technicians uh, to, to capture this data. Uh, so that that would allow the pharmacist to do the pharmacy work and it would allow the, um, the stock control and the consumer uh, data be to, to be done by this, uh, by this technician. Uh, so I, I really think that, you know, ACEs in their places get the right people doing the right things uh, and who are correctly trained. I mean, the other thing is, is that I, I got excited. I don't know if I've already mentioned this, but I got really excited when I went to Rwanda because I heard the word uh, logistics management information system and it had an S on the end and I thought, wow, you know, this is, this is great to uh, plug me in. Um, and then I found out it wasn't a system, it was, it was paper-based and you know, they were writing out the, uh, the name of the patient, the, the, the product, the date, um, the quantity, never the batch number. And then they'd accumulate this over many, many weeks, over for, for a month, and then they'd hand it into the Ministry of Health. And, and yes, uh, you know, that's a start. It is an absolute great start. 
but uh, we, we need to move on. And uh, you, you're, you're quite right, there's technology out there. Uh, one cheap technology that uh, we're looking at at the moment is the use of barcoding um, at the health facility level because you can barcode, possibly barcode a card from the patient, barcode the product, and you've got instant correlation between the two and hopefully it can get zapped up into the cloud. And if it doesn't get zapped up there, maybe when they visit the village it can get zapped up at that point in time. So you're getting real-time accurate data rather than all of these mistakes. And you're quite right, sometimes this, this stuff gets to the Minister of Health and then they're, uh, they're looking at these reports and they're doing the typing. Uh, and you know, either they get the name wrong, or the product wrong, or the number wrong, or the date wrong. And so, uh, it, it's, it's, uh, it, we've got to somewhere automise this. But again, you know, in a lot of the, a lot of the countries that we're working in, uh, it's, it's very difficult because they haven't even got electricity at the uh, um, at, down at the health facility level. However, it's qu quite amazing how many have actually got mobile uh, now, mobile connections, and uh, which, which is really good. And we can always, up, if we can, you know, most smartphones have got barcode readers on them now, uh, or and then FC near, near field communication, and so you've got that sort of technology, and you can give them a solar panel. So, so uh, that, that's the sort of way that we can capture the data if we're uh, innovative and we want to, to do it that way. It's a very good question, but indeed, there's a variety of solutions we need to implement it and scale it up, and and key of which is also avoid running parallel different system because there will be, we need standards, same standard because otherwise they're not comparable. So we need to work on that, absolutely. One the, last the only thing I want to yeah. add is that there is technology transfer, all right? There are people who work on them, expertise is available. Knowledge about what it can do, things like uh, um, my brother here was saying, they are correct. But again, solutions are quite expensive, just like drugs. Some of us cannot afford. If you sit as a government minister and you're committing several millions of dollars for a particular solution to drive your LMIs, I mean, it's, you, you sit back and say, can I allocate this resource at no bashing from society and no bashing from the communities? So we have to look at those two. So we are looking at prices for drugs. Let us also look at prices for health solutions. After all, they are not things that should come with huge margins. But let us look at social responsibility. We all try and look at universal health coverage. And those of you in that profession too should begin to look at how we can break even with some little margins and let us be able to afford solutions that will work for us. Unfortunately, I cannot open up. I've just been told this is time to go. So we, we, we hope to see you here next year. And if you've got any other question, we are here and do come ask us. We provided the, some contact names earlier. Feel free to contact us. And we hope to continue this discussion uh, next year and, and, and the years to come. And, and thank you so much for participating and thank you so much for your very interesting questions. Have a great day.